Hi everybody, so welcome back. For our first sets of slides, we're really going to be talking about the issue of food access, focusing more so on food deserts. But one thing I want you to start thinking about is why doesn't some people have access to the capability of buying, storing, transporting fresh fruits, vegetables, meats, cheeses, and other foods that require special types of storage? Um, also, why is it that some people can't afford some of the fresh fruits and vegetable options? Are there, are there certain foods that are more or are less expensive? How nutrient dense are those foods? So just something to kind of think about in the back of your mind while we're going through this set of slides. All right, so if you look at this set of slides, or if you look at the slide, you can see that food access is influenced by numerous factors. So we're going to go through picture by picture and describe what exactly meant by each of these topics. Um, so first, in the video we heard a little bit more about this, but food access is influenced by politics. So we saw in the movie Food Stamps that certain foods have been subsidized, right, help being paid for by our federal government, and that does what? That reduces the amount that that particular food will cost consumers. So in that way, it influences what we have more readily available access to, um, as well as some of our trade laws uh, enhance our access to different types of foods that might not necessarily be grown here in the United States. We see in the upper right corner um, a picture of different globes and, and different types of seeds and spices and, and foods grown in different parts of the world. You'll have access to, you'll have uh, different types of soils um, that are more prone for growing different types of, of food products. At the same time, although this is not necessarily implied by this picture, is that in the environment and also environmental health impacts what we're able to grow where and when. And so one question is, is with climate change, what will happen with food production? Will certain foods that could be more Readily, uh, readily grown in um, more humid or rainier environments as it might get drier in some areas will we see a change in what could be grown um, in those once more humid areas. In, in areas that are experiencing flooding, what will that do to what's being grown um, in, in the areas that again once could uh, be able to sustain the growth of certain crops. So let's say that there's sea level rise and it affects uh, the California coast and the Florida coast. Well, a lot of our food are grown in coastal states. So what exactly will that do to the supply of food? Um, food sustainability is a whole area of, of, of study that focuses on the production, um, the, the way food is sold, how it's processed and distributed, how it's consumed, and, and also uh, linked back to waste, um, examining the entire food cycle. This last picture towards the uh, bottom right hand side of your, your, your screen is really talking uh, about science and technology, how new developments are changing the food supply, uh, where now we've got um, access to gen genetically modified foods. So also to kind of touch on the topic of genetically modified foods, you'll find documentaries that are both for and against uh, the use of, of chemicals um, and, and modifying our food supply to be able to ensure that we've got enough product for a growing population to consume. Now on one side, we're not really sure how changing our food supply is changing our own bi biology. Uh, in what way is that impacting our health and, and health of, of other living beings? Um, at the same time, what do you do when you've got a growing population a changing environment and you're not sure that you could produce foods without genetically modifying them. So it's not really a black or white issue as to, you know, is it right to have genetically modified foods? It's, it's kind of uh, falling on a spectrum and, and kind of weighing your pros and cons of, of um, having enough supply uh, as well as what will this down the road, how will this impact our health? Food supply is also, or food access is also uh, geographically influenced. 
the USDA, and this is this is from Feeding America, but you can get other um, food desert locators from the USDA food desert locator site. Um, at the time that that the information that I gathered was published, which was in 2016, um, there was a map that looks very similar to this particular map that shows um, food deserts. And uh, on the USDA food desert locator, you could actually click on certain areas and see name and population size served or who were living in those food deserts. And you can see that there are about 23.5 million Americans living in these areas in which people have a hard time accessing fresh foods. Uh, so consumer choices in food spending and diet are likely to be influenced by their accessibility as well as affordability of food retailers, also influenced by travel time shopping, availability of healthy foods, and food prices. So really, the idea of what a food desert is is when you live in an area in which you have little to no access to fresh foods which we know tend to be healthier for you, right? Um, in this particular picture, there's a man that's standing in front of a corner store in West Oakland, California. So, um, however, in this neighborhood, there are about 25,000 people living within eight miles, and there are 53 corner stores and no commercial grocery stores. So if you were to look at this picture, try to think to yourself, like, what types of foods, what type of food items would you find? Well, you can look at the picture and you can look at what's being advertised and you see some cold cuts and you see some frozen foods. What do we know about frozen foods? They're high in salt. And they're not often the healthiest foods for you. There are some fresh meats. Um, there's also a supply of alcohol. You can, see, um, you can see signs for cigarettes. You can see what looks like a little ice cream. Um, you know, refrigerated box on the outside, that, that could be something else, though, I'm not quite sure. Um, you see, again, uh, advertisements for alcohol, um, but really the likelihood that you're going to find fresh fruits and vegetables that are, again, uh, nutrient-rich are pretty limited. And if you did find them, you'd probably find, what, some apples, some bruised bananas and bruised apples, um, you know, old oranges, and, and really something that's not quite as appetizing and, again, not as nutrient-dense as being able to access what you'd be able to find in a grocery store. So I thought this was a pretty cute cartoon because it just shows you that in food deserts, more often you'd find fast food. You'd find junk food. You'd find food that really isn't lower in calorie and higher in nutrients. So you see lower quality food and that actually increases the risk for being overweight or obese is having that lack of access to fresh fruit, fruits, vegetables, um, and, and other uh, food sources. So here are a couple of questions. Uh, well, here's one question about what led to the condition of food deserts. Now, I really want you to pay attention to this because this is incredibly important. You will be asked a question about uh, what led to the creation, what led to the condition of food deserts on your next exam. So make sure that you review this. So grocery stores, following the trend of a lot of different types of retail businesses in the post-World War II era, era of urban sprawl, if you remember what we talked about in that last class of our cities expanding, we saw abandoned inner cities in exchange for cheaper land, bigger stores, and more affluent customers, so wealthier people that were living out in the suburbs. So that really incentivized grocery stores to move out to the suburbs. So if you think of big stores like Walmart and Costco and Sam's Club um, and even like Super Targets, is it cheaper, you think, to buy land in, say, downtown Phoenix or in areas like Gilbert? Well. Areas like Gilbert and even um, some areas of, you know, South Phoenix and, and, you know, not the downtown area, the real estate's cheaper. There's more land available. So it makes more sense for these larger stores that can sell items in bulk to open up there as compared to downtown areas. So sometimes you'll see areas, again, such as downtown Phoenix that are currently um, 
considered food deserts because there's that lack of uh, a grocery store, community, or, or a retail, commercial retail grocery store. So that influences access, and that also means that you have to have a way to get to those to those larger stores, or a way to get to those grocery stores. So more often you have to have a car to be able to, or some form of public transportation that will, in essence, drop you off on its route at one of these stores so you could go buy groceries. In the next picture, where you've got this beautiful farmland, you've seen that traditionally food's been treated as an agricultural and thus a rural issue. But the co components of a food system influence and are influenced by cities. And land use involved in food production and packaging is really both an urban and a rural health issue. Um, so more recently we found that about 80% of Americans live in urban areas, which means that urban populations are the largest market for agricultural products. Thus they don't produce a significant proportion of America's food supply, urban areas certainly have a significant role in the system, making food systems the issues of both rural and urban areas. So again, really treating food production and food sales as a rural issue has really hampered um, food access in more urban areas. At the bottom of the screen on your left hand side, you see this random lonely grocery cart. And um, so there are a number of reasons why super, supermarkets have also left cities and downtown areas. Central city locations more often endure a higher crime rate, resulting in inflated insurance premiums for those stores. So just to give you an example of what can happen in terms of grocery stores when there's a higher crime rate is that shopping, co shopping carts are often stolen. They play this intriguing role. Uh, due to decreased vehicle ownership, residents in lower income areas often take shopping carts home with them as a means of transporting their goods home. And it can cost stores up to $67,000 per year to replace and retrieve grocery carts. So now you'll find that a lot of grocery stores actually have these stoppers on the back of the wheel where if you go off of, the, if you take the cart off the premise, of the um, grocery store's property, the, the wheels will lock up. And again, the reason that stores have begun doing that is to reduce the amount of theft of grocery, grocery carts. Last but not least, we have this one last picture. That, that middle picture actually kind of goes together with Sprawl Mart and Costco and that, um, that picture up in the top left corner. In the bottom right corner, you see this picture of different types of fast food restaurant, Carl's Jr., McDonald's, Hardee's, etc. This picture is, you know, a graphic presentation, representation of how in food deserts, when people still need some type of food in order to survive, more often what you'll find are that these fast food restaurants pop up in those areas. And um, as you can all imagine, these are not the healthiest options. These are pretty calorically dense foods with less nu nutritional value than, say, fresh foods. So all of those factors, again, influence the creation of food deserts. Now, for our next set of slides, we're going to talk about how to increase food access, uh, both fiscally but also geographically. So stay tuned for the next set of slides.